Hello, wine abbers. My name is Jesse Meekum, and this is podcast number 53 for You Need a Budget, where we teach you four rules to help you stop living paycheck to paycheck, get out of debt, and save more money. Today, I want to go a little bit behind the scenes. We have a lot of things going on, and I uh, kind of want to talk about where we've been as a company, and maybe a little bit about just what uh, what goes on here with the team. We're getting bigger and uh, I'm starting to realize that a big portion of my job is is the company, not the product um, or the marketing, but uh, or haven't you know haven't helped me the bookkeeping. But uh, a lot of it's the the people and uh, kind of the culture, the team that we have here. So that was a takeaway that I got from the Business of Software conference last I don't know when it was two weeks ago. Um. When I first started out, I'll tell you a quick story. If you're thinking about launching a product or service, um, I, as most of you know, I started WineAb because, uh, and it wasn't called WineAb, it was called nothing. Um, I started a spreadsheet. I kid you not, I was taking a intro level information systems class to, as a prerequisite to be able to get into the business school at uh, Brigham Young University. Go Cougars. We, we need the help. Uh, so we're, um, I'm taking this class. I'm learning about Excel and spreadsheets, and I'm thinking, these are pretty handy, you know, all these formulas you can do. And I also get engaged. It's November. I'm sitting down in the library. I didn't own a computer, so I used the, the libraries that were all over the campus. And I'm sitting down in the library. Julie worked at the library, so I was down there on the same floor she was on. She worked in an area called Special Collections, where they had dealt with like old documents and artifacts and things. Pretty cool. And um, I'm sitting there in one of the labs waiting for her to get off work. And I'm looking at our combined income and it, it would be uh, horrible, you know, be really, really bad. I think I was making t- 10 bucks an hour. Maybe Julie was making eight. I was teaching German. And um, so I think we need a budget. You know, we really, really do. And I had these skills from, uh, you know, my intro level spreadsheet class. So I start building the spreadsheet and I wish I could show you guys the initial sped- spreadsheet. All of my categories were spread, uh, from left to right. They were, they were, uh, columns. And then all, every single day of the year was a row. And whenever I spent money that day, I would drop it in the appropriate category you know, appropriate column, and then the appropriate day, row. And every one of those was, each of the groups of rows was broken into months. So at the end of the month, I could scan across and see, oh, okay, I spent this much here, spent this much here. And when we first got married, we were in the honeymoon phase. So I'd ask Julie, I said, hey, I want to do this budget. And of course, I could do no wrong, you know. So she's like, oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, you bet. She was frugal. She She brought money to the table. And I spent all of my money on the ring that she was wearing, which wasn't tons of money to begin with, to be honest. But at any rate, um, we start doing the budget and it works out well. I noticed right away, and some of you know this story, but uh, the state of Utah sends me a, you know, a year later, we bought our first car uh, a few months after we got married. Before that, we were doing buses and like begging people to use their car and things like that when we needed to go grocery shopping or whatever. So we... um we bought this car a few months after we get married. And then a year after we buy it, I get a letter from the state of Utah and they're saying, here's your renewal thing. And it costs 120 bucks or something, $125. And we were floored because I was thinking we, we, we already paid your tax. When we bought the car, we registered the car. If the ownership changes, we'll re-register it, you know, under, under a new owner and you'll get the tax again. But no, you register the car every year, which you all know. I didn't know that because I'd never owned a car. So this was all news to me and uh, totally freaked me out because we had 125 bucks we weren't planning on spending. And that was a big deal to us. So I immediately set out, you know, set up a new category on our spreadsheet, a new column. And I called it uh, license and taxes and or license and registration or something. It's a tax. So we... Um, Set aside, you know, 125 divided by 12, which is, for those of you that want to know, 
ten dollars and forty two cents. And at the end of those twelve months, you would actually have a few pennies left over. So we start setting aside that ten bucks and forty one forty two cents every month. So we'd be ready for the uh, licenses or the registration, whatever it is, the tax. So um, I also noticed that uh, the budget wouldn't balance if we overspent. It, it would basically overstate other categories. So we have category A with a $100 surplus, and we overspend in category B uh, by $20. That money came from somewhere, and it wasn't being addressed because – you could just leave category B, uh, just let it roll if you were being really bad. And the spreadsheet had no way of enforcing that. And that's where I came up with uh, what's now rule three. I didn't call it a rule at that time. I was just trying to get the budget to balance. So I said, oh, well, I'll just take any overages. I'll just take from next month's money that's available to budget so that we, we kind of pay it back and replenish. And then I'll zero out that category that went negative. That was purely to balance the budget. It had nothing to do with flexibility, with rolling with the punches. I wasn't nearly that smart. Um, rule four. I mean, rule one was a slam dunk. It's like, give every dollar a job. Why wouldn't you? That makes sense. So that, that was no big deal. Um, but rule four came about because we were on variable incomes. And I just thought, this is insane to try and give every dollar a job when we don't know how many dollars we have. And I didn't like guessing because then you'd have to go back and change everything again. So I just thought, hey, let's use some of our wedding money. You know, when, when you get married, people just give you money. And we used it to help us buy a car. Uh, and we used it to help us get a month ahead. So we totally cheated. And I tell all of you, hey, get going on your buffer. Build it up, scrimp, and save. We didn't do any of that. We just got married. So if you can get married to build your buffer... I highly recommend it. It's it's quite lucrative, except if you have to pay for your wedding, and then it's not. So you just you'll have to decide. But our our wedding was so unbelievably inexpensive. Sometimes I wish we actually would have spent more on it. Of course, that's easy to say now. But um, so rule four, you know, stop living paycheck to paycheck. It wasn't called that. It was like, uh, yeah, we'll we'll spend last month's money this month because then we'll know what we have. And that makes perfect sense. So we rolled with those rules that weren't called rules for a year. And then uh, during that year, uh, Porter came along. Well, he was, he was in transit. And um, so we're, you know, new babies on the way or whatever. And uh, I'm sitting there doing some serious number crunching. I was working for a big company doing an internship and I got a good internship in internal audit I was working on my master's degree in accounting, had three years left of school, and uh, this baby's coming. I don't want to go into debt for school. So far, so good. Julie was now graduated and working full-time, making 11 bucks an hour as a social worker, which is a highly lucrative field, um, So, but had good benefits, and we were grateful for that. So we, uh, we're crunching numbers. Well, I'm crunching numbers. I'm sitting on top of a wedding gift we got, which was actually – a large Dr. Pepper can that was a cooler. And that was our seat uh, at our desk. The desk that uh, I was using, I remember I built, I brought it in from Walmart in a massive box and I brought over my friend who was an engineer, uh, a nuclear engineer. It took us four and a half hours to assemble that desk. And then we realized once we'd assembled it that we would never get it out of our basement apartment because the door was so small to get out. So we actually had to disassemble it when we moved. That was total tangent. I apologize. Um, I'm crunching numbers, realize that no matter what I do or how many hours I work, you know, realistically, we will not have enough money to make it through school on the savings we had accumulated Um with Julie no longer having to work. And it was a really big deal to me that she didn't work that, you know, the baby comes and she focuses on Porter. I just thought that that's the only way we could, we could do this. That it was just, it was uh, non, you know, non-negotiable for me and, and for Julie as well. Uh, that was something that she wanted more than anything. So, um, that was why I started YNAB. Uh, to make enough money to pay our rent, which was 350 bucks. So, and it included phone, 
and all of the utilities, $350. And it's true, we were sick a lot of the time because I think there was a mold problem. So we had these weird throat things going on the entire time we lived there. But 350 bucks, you know. So that was my goal with, uh, with, with YNAB. I thought if I could sell this spreadsheet, I'd showed it to friends. Uh, they thought it was pretty cool. Of course, I'd only showed it to accountants. So, of course, they thought it was cool. Like, oh, yeah, spreadsheet. Awesome. It calculates. So for what that was worth, that was my market research. And then I went to a friend that uh, did some internet marketing. And I said, hey, do you think I could sell this budgeting system? And he's like, yeah, yeah, you could sell it. I'll show you how to, you know, move up in the rankings on Google. And I, had no, you know, I'll show you how to do SEO. And I was SEO. Yeah, I had no idea what he's talking about. Um, so he kind of shows me the ropes on that. And I, I learned how to build websites. I did the spreadsheet and you know, I improved it quite a bit, made it so it was presentable. And then my first, uh, sales copy was basically like a guide on how to use the spreadsheet. It's like, okay, here's the first sheet. Here's the second sheet. Here's the, it, it had no concept of like separate accounts or anything. You just, you bunched all of your transactions and it had, it didn't care about accounts, which is cool. When you think about it, because we don't care about accounts now, but we just let you reconcile a lot easier to them. But uh, yeah, it didn't care about accounts. It didn't have any fancy scheduling. It didn't do any sort of importing. Everything was manual. And I attribute a lot of that manual work to our success early on. Uh, it worked because we worked it. You know, it wasn't some autopilot uh, faux, you know, progress thing that you're doing where you feel like you're making something happen and you're not, you're just, anyway, you're getting like a dopamine shot, but no actual behavioral change. So I asked Julie, you think I can sell this? She said, no, but I sold it anyway, or started to. I initially listed the spreadsheet for nine ninety five, and nobody bought it. Luckily at the time you could buy ads uh, through AdWords, you know, pay-per-click ads. And I had $67 that I had allocated for my budget to buy ads. Well, okay. The first thing I did was I, I made flyers and blanketed our new apartment complex because we moved out by the time I launched it. And uh, I remember going back home and logging into the uh, stat counter to see hits to the website. And I could see the from the IP addresses, you can tell you know roughly where people are. And I could see that three people had visited the site based on my three hours of of going door to door. I remember Julie was going around with me with Porter and the stroller. Um, I'd go up the stairs. She'd stay. She wouldn't go up the stairs with the stroller. And then she went home early. Cause she's like, Hey, uh, I got to take the baby in. And you know, I kept going. And that was the most ineffective way to market an ad, you know, an online business. I also remember I bought stickers and put them on the back of our Chevy prism. It said, you know, the letter sticker. So it said, you need a budget.com. And then underneath it said, yes, you do. But our prism was so um, unattractive by any standard that that was really pretty embarrassing when I think about it. Now, I mean, here's this guy driving around saying, you need a budget. And I'm driving like <laughs> like the uh, the crappiest car on, car on the road. That's a good car. The Chevy prism is a well-kept secret. And if we hadn't totaled, as our, totaled ours years ago, I'd still be driving it. But um Anyway, that was also an ineffective way of advertising. It was probably counter uh, to my, you know, intentions. So I buy ads on AdWords and you know spend some money. Luckily, AdWords was inexpensive back then, and um, nobody buys it. So I'm kind of down. I go to my friend that does the online marketing, and he says, "Well, what are you selling it for?" And I said, "Well, I'm selling it for nine ninety five because it's a spreadsheet. I mean, come on, people." They could just make their own spreadsheet, even though I did, you know, I had hours and hours into that spreadsheet. That did, that actually argument doesn't make any sense. Um, and he's like, "Well, you're you're charging too little. You should double the price." So I doubled the price up to nineteen ninety five, and got my first sale that very day. I would tell you the person's email address, but I don't want to be public with it. But it was a Yahoo.com email address, and had something to do with Scooby Doo. Uh, and this lady writes me a few hours later and says, I can't get this to work. And the reason she couldn't get it to work is because I didn't have a Mac at the time and she had a Mac and she had bought it. And so I go over to the only place I know that has Macs, which is at the school, to their labs, and I try and get it to run and I couldn't 
figure it out. So I had to refund her money. So my very first sale was a refund to that yahoo.com email address. But the next sale that I made, I didn't have to refund. And I was really glad for the few people that bought the software early on because it gave me enough of, you know, enough confidence to be able to say, hey, this is viable. And then uh, five months later, Taylor contacts me and says, hey, can I help you improve your spreadsheet? I'm a developer. This was uh, early 2005. I say, well, I don't really want to do the spreadsheet anymore. I'd rather have a full-blown application. So he gets to work. Uh, he was down in Texas. I was in Utah. He gets to work on it, and um, we go over the phone constantly. And we basically port the spreadsheet over to a standalone Windows application. And um, it took us, I think, nine months. Well, it took Taylor nine months. I was able to pay Taylor. He was just moonlighting, so I just paid him kind of on milestone basis. And um, he, we, you know, we launch it November of 2000. Ooh, 2005. Man, I, I'm having a hard time. Yeah, I think it was. And um, it start, it sells really well. That same month, I launched the forums, which ended up being a massive help to us because the forums have turned out to be just this great section, just this great bunch of people that really love the method and get excited about it and, and love helping people, St- loving helping strangers. So that that's awesome. Um, that was Taylor moonlighted for a long time. Uh, and then I finally wooed him away and had him come on full time, um, in 2008, the middle of 2008, I think. Ah, it could have been 2000. Ah, it was 2008. Yeah. So got him on full time. And then from there, you know, we we operated as a, is a two man deal for a while, but then we had some part time help. Uh, Steve ran support, still does. Um, Aaron started doing some webinars for us, and um, then we hired an assistant for me. I think it was in two thousand ten, um, and then a month later we hired Ian, who's a who's our desk one of our desktop developers, and then. Um, Two months later, later we hired Steve full time, and then six months later we hired Aaron full time to manage the teaching, do a lot of the teaching, work on all the curriculum stuff. Um, and then in the meantime, Sebastian w- had written us and sent us some screenshots of, a, of an iPhone application he'd started building for himself to use YNAB, and we were like, "Whoa, we're interested in that!" So we uh, we jumped on that, and and um, we figured out a deal with Sebastian. And he moonlighted for a long time, uh, worked on the iPhone app. And then when we launched the iPhone app, and um, I want to say two years after that, we got Sebastian full-time. Um, we hired you know, some other part-time people in the meantime, uh, Angela in support, uh, Joe in support, but he, he's not doing support anymore for us. He's moved on. Um, Melissa and Lee and Todd, they were all doing teaching. Todd, Todd does one-on-one coaching for us, although now he has, he has a, doesn't have as much time because he's got a pretty sweet real job. So um, we're just picking up, uh, picking up more people. And then we've got Graham that does the uh, Android work. We had a full-time Android uh, developer, but that didn't work out, and so we're, we're on the hunt again. Um, and now we're hiring an iOS, another full-time iOS developer to help us with the iPad app. Um, and we'll see how that goes. We're also uh, looking to hire a full-time, not a full-time, but a part-time quality assurance person. And I'm going through, we had about 100 applications for that. I'm going through that. So we, we kind of went really slow for a little bit, and now it feels like we're going fast. And I'm really trying to just take it in stride. I'm trying to not be, you know, super risk averse. I'm trying to uh, be be smart, you know, but not be so slow that we're we're developing too slow. And I know a lot of you guys, um, especially you Android folk, you don't like the fact that the iPhone's a year ahead um, in development. But it's, you know, it's because we started the iPhone a year earlier, and it was a safer bet for us. So that that was the reason we started earlier. Uh, it was just a more proven. 
and um, it does make more money than the Android one does, uh, and always has, even on it when it was a stripped down feature set. Uh, the iPhone people just purchase more. Uh, they're, they're like they they're like trigger happy on purchasing. So that's the reason for that. Uh, it's not that we want to go slow. It's just um, you were, we're certainly not like playing favorites. It, kind of, it's a lot of economics in there. And then finding the right people. But um, we've got Graham who moonlights. We've got him going on it uh, steady. And um, we're making progress there. And then the iPad app, we're cert- we're uh, right now in wireframing mode. So we haven't even coded for it yet. It's going to be a, a long process for the iPad. But I'm hoping to get, you know, with some uh, another iOS developer to join Sebastian that we can move on it quicker than we could otherwise. So that's kind of where we're at. Uh, it's a fun place to work. And by place, I mean that everyone works remotely. So um, we're pretty fun. We have a good time. Uh, everyone's very autonomous. We're fairly flat. Um, I'm the king, but the organization is so flat that I'm not up very high. Uh, Taylor's kind of my right-hand man. Oh, I forgot to mention because it was just two months ago we hired Chance, who's our, kind of like a, our COO. And um, he's taking a lot off my plate so I can work more on product and on the company, uh, which is awesome. That's, I'm really happy with that, that, uh, how that's worked out. So all in all, it's a, it's a great place to work. We don't have a lot of ego here. Um, if I have a stupid idea, then that's fine because I know you're going to have a stupid idea in just a moment and then everything will be even. And, um, we are slow in our deliberation. Uh, we change our minds a lot behind the scenes. Um, we debate, uh, an unbelievably, uh, just way in depth. Um, I'm okay with that. We've done about faces before. We've done things where we've gone through 19 comps of how something's going to look. And then we say, oh, what about this? And then Adam, our designer, who I forgot to mention, good grief. We got Adam full-time. Oh, I can't remember now. It's been a good bit. He's helped us absolutely a ton. So that's been awesome. Um, Anyway, we'll go through comps and then we'll say, well, what about this? And like 20 comps in and then Adam says, oh, you mean like the second comp? And, you know, lo and behold, that second comp is the one we like. So that kind of stuff just takes time. But we never put something out that we aren't happy with because we've had we had a bad experience with that with what I felt and what Taylor felt was a little bit of a rush with YNAB 3. Um, we're continually improving on Facebook. Someone mentioned that we're a lot like Portuguese politicians. I think we're like every politician. Wait, no, I don't mean that. But he said, because we're all talk, but we don't work. And that's not true. We do work. We work hard. Uh, it's just thing takes, things take a lot longer than you think they take. And they're more expensive than you think they are. And, uh, so we're just, we go and we go at my pace that I'm comfortable with. And I'm trying to get more comfortable with a little bit faster pace, but that's where it is. That's kind of the story and that's kind of where we're at. And I'm kind of excited for the future. I think we have a lot of prospects. Uh, the team is growing and I think it's growing at, uh, growing for the right reasons, not growing for growth's sake. Uh, we're still totally bootstrapped. Even like it, uh, I get contacted by venture capital firms fairly regularly and all the, they're all the same, you know, I mean, as far as like the, the whole intro and phone call and all that, they're all the same. So um, that's that. But uh, we're doing well, and I'm, I am grateful for our customers that basically have voted for us with their dollars. We're not certainly not the least expensive option out there, but I think we add a lot of value. And so I, I like where we're at. Um, I'm appreciative to all of the customers that tell other people about us. And uh, I'm pretty excited for what we have coming up as far as, I don't know, just a little more YNAB swag, you know, kind of thing that we're going to be working on. And I don't know, we just have a lot in the, a lot of irons in the fire that uh, make me excited. So this was a bit of a rambly podcast. I uh, hope you got something out of it. The lesson, if I were to give you just one, is if you're thinking about selling a product or a service, you are pricing it too low just you are and uh, up that price there's perceived value there uh, with price and it's it's a real deal so 
I will leave it at that. Until next time, follow 1M's four rules and you will win financially. You have not budgeted like this. 